This is Linda Aronson, author of Unleashed to Learn. In this episode of Unleashed to Live, we feature Joe Dang, a quintessential millennial entrepreneur. In just three short years, Joe has created and opened two highly successful Lime Red tea houses in Amherst and Northampton, Massachusetts. Joe is set to franchise Lime Red while opening a spin-off near Boston University. On the side, Joe is a small business consultant and a special events photographer. Joe has valuable commentary on 21st century education and advice for aspiring millennial entrepreneurs. Hi, this is Linda Aronson. I'm here with Joe D Dang um, at uh, Lime Red. He is the founder and owner of Lime Red Tea House here in Amherst, Massachusetts. And um, I'm here, this is the uh, another episode for Unleashed to Live. Uh, Joe is a quintessential model for entrepreneurship and we'll talk about um, the ventures that he has undertaken in the last several uh, years that I've watched him with great applause um, and all that he's been able to do. So Joe, welcome. Hi, thank you. Okay. Well, could you just give us the backstory of how Lime Red came into being? You had talked to me before about how you developed a business plan way back when you were uh, uh, a oh, sunny, yeah, in college, a sunny student in, in Binghamton and so on and so forth, and then coming into this area, being a college town and so on and so forth. you just want to give us a backstory on that? Uh, well, yeah. I'm going to go down, okay? Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's pretty simple. It's actually almost too simple. And, and that part is that when we were in college, we loved our bubble tea. So... Uh, we would hang around in dorm rooms and we would uh, order bubble tea usually, so almost every day. And when we did that, it, the delivery times took about an hour and change. And we would always be like, who would take so long? You know, and, and that's like classic book, right? Which is like you find a problem and you're like, okay, how can I solve it? So immediately we're like, these guys are obviously making too much money. We need to get in on this and, you know, help them out a little bit because obviously <laughs> they can't get the bubble tea here any faster, right? So. So that was where we hatched the plan. We said, okay, there's so many students and we figured, well, we're normal. Everybody must be like us, you know? They must all be ordering bubble tea every single day. And so we did that. So we actually cracked out a plan. It was a, kind of a sweet room time type of thing. So me and my partner and a few other friends actually got in and actually legitly made a business plan. Uh, we got everything up to, we talked to our parents about the funding, you know, like all like wide-eyed, you know, like sure. all naive and whatnot. And then uh, we approached uh, to where at the time we got the lease. Then they started asking about credit, and they started asking about well, all these you know financing terms that I had no idea what they were about, you know, and and ultimately they decided that maybe these college kids aren't the ones that we're going to go with in terms of giving the space for you know us building our dream. So at that point, um, you know, this was in Binghamton, New York. Yeah, and okay. so uh, so that that was it, you know, and so uh, after that we, we just forgot about it, and you know we all graduated, did our own thing, you know, all, every one of us pretty much went out to be like a consultant or some kind of like corporate entity. Uh, and my partner went on to, to take care of his own family business. Uh, two years later, I got a little unhappy with the, you know what was going on in the corporate world. At the same time, it was during the financial breakdown, so that was a subprime mortgage uh, crisis. And um, what was your position? Uh, then I was still a regular consultant. I was uh, due to be promoted to be senior consultant. Uh, so uh, I already started, the, the moment before I left, I already started managing to, you know, two or three teams, two or three projects. And so it was getting quite serious, you know, on that path. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so, but some, something happened during the, you know, the, I guess, you know, our version of the mini Great Depression. Uh, and, 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 you know, we lost a lot of people. Uh, it just had to happen and uh, you know it, during that time it, it really affected me very very hard and uh, and so I was looking for a new job I was basically saying that you know uh, I'm not sure if if I want to be here you know with the way that they treated the people that had to go right. um, it, it was just harsh you know mm -hmm. having to sit there watch your all your friends just go mm -hmm. into a room and come out and the whole world's changed you know mm -hmm. And it didn't matter if it was 10 years, 20 years in the service, you know, it, it, it was just, you know. <clears throat> and I wish that we could have done other things to keep them on board for as long as we could. But at, but the corporate company did not do that. And, and so I, I basically, I was on that. So I, I was ready to go and uh, I was ready to sort of just <clears throat> figure out, I'll move aboard, abroad, you know, and, and, and maybe go to Hong Kong or somewhere like that and get a job there and, you know, just try something new, you know, might as well for me. 
Sure. Uh, and, and at that point, I was talking to my partner, and uh, and he he was just you know throwing some ideas. I was with my girlfriend at the time, and, and she you know and at that time she loved bubble tea. And we went every day, and uh, you know, and then she was like, "Oh, I'm about to go back to school." You know, she went to Smith College, mm -hmm. and you're like, "Oh, so what's the big deal? Let's go get bubble tea there," you know. And then she was like, "There is no bubble tea there." And then, uh, and then that's basically what sparked my soon-to-be partner to be like, "Well, Joe, uh, we do have a plan." <laughs> <laughs> and so that I mean that's really how it came to be. And then he, I don't know why, but he somehow convinced me to not pursue a job uh, in Hong Kong and live. Happily ever after in a high tall rise and cushy cushy lifestyle, and to, to come to, to come here and, and and work like you know good old fashioned American way. So All right. and uh, that's really the backstory of, of how how uh, it got started and reignited. Yeah. And so you just want to talk a little bit about what's developed since you started. You you have opened up another store, another a tea house in in Northampton, and you're developing other things. What what are your other enterprises at this point? Oh, well, I mean, immediately, uh, all right. Um, so opening Northampton was kind of a, a bit of a selfish thing because that was the first spot we were going to open was Northampton oh. for the Smith people. Oh, right, right, oh, <laughs> right. Okay, right, right. And uh, uh, however, uh, you know, just looking at the numbers, it didn't make sense. You know, I had 30,000 people in UMass and I had, you know, and then of course, uh, IMS College I had another 2,500. And then, uh, and then we only had about two two thousand five hundred uh, people at Smith College. So when you looked at the numbers, it really didn't make sense for uh, Northampton to be the first location. But we always wanted the you know the founders really always wanted to have one in Northampton. So we did. On our second year, we opened our second store, and uh, we were very happy to do so to be able to finally go with the original vision of giving Smithies a place for bubble tea. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then. And then uh, I believe this is my third year. So on uh, my third year, uh, we're opening a uh, different, we're exploring different things. We uh, were fortunate enough to find a good spot uh, by Boston University. Mm. And we're gonna wow. open a sort of a, you know, a spin-off of this concept. I mean, uh -huh. we here it's called Lime Red. Our, our new place is called Limu. It's very, very similar. Uh -huh. uh, Limu means lime in Farsi. So oh, okay. yeah, my, uh, my, uh, my new partner is Persian. And so, you know, we kind of, do a little bit of that, oh, and uh, yeah, and uh, and uh, he owns uh, a business around here called Moti, and so we figured lime red, Moti, Limu was a very good mix of the two. Uh, so, oh, very cool! Yeah, and so that hence came the new name. And the different concept here is that we take the bubble teas that you know we've been making for years, and uh, now we're gonna kind of make new recipes that include alcohol in it and whatnot, just to try to kind of. Uh, play on this uh, tradition and and all of it is really what inspires it is really the vision to bring unadulterated tastes to Americans uh, a lot of the times you know I've, I've always talked about it you know like you know Chinese people don't make real Chinese food you know because they are definitely afraid that Americans would hate it you know that they can't handle the skin that they can't look at the head or the neck of, of certain animals uh, and and so in, in that way their own their own uh, I guess discriminant you know, mm -hmm. the views of what Americans like and don't like preclude them from liking the actual food that we eat. Right. So, and, and, and so I try not to do that. We try to have as authentic taste as we can at Lime Red. And, and, and what part of that, our culture, you know, the culture of, uh, and I'm not talking about old Asian culture, like the ones in the movies or the dynasties or things. I'm talking about relatively new urban Asian culture. Sure. Uh, you know, when my travels in Hong Kong and in Shanghai and Beijing and those areas where, you know, I was hanging out with a lot of the, you know, the youth. Mm -hmm. You know, and because it's a new culture for them too, because it's a new urban culture of China, which has never been, you know, right. because it's only possible recently. And so what they do is they mix uh, green tea and, and whiskey. Right. And they do a lot of drink creations with tea as their base, not you know cranberry juice or orange juice and whatnot. And that has always been you know a healthy alternative because it has a lot less calories than like <laughs> juices and whatnot. And and then, and all of course all the antioxidants in tea are still all valid, even though the alcohol really puts a dent on it. I, I believe. Right. <clears throat> so all in all, you know, I wanted to make that kind of experience here in the states as well. You mm -hmm. know, and that and that's all, and that was always really the founding vision of, of all my businesses. Yeah, that's food related. Is really just to bring a, a new urban style from abroad, you know, mm -hmm. here because I don't know why McDonald's has to have apple pie in America, but taro pie in China, and no <laughs> apple pies in China. You know, <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, know and there's no coconut pie or taro pie here in the states, you know, because Americans we must have only apple pie, nothing else. <laughs> Any other pie would be blasphemy. 
right. and, and so and so I want to break that tradition you know right. so that's why I'm bringing things over and translating it all uh, and then uh, on, on the side of that you know um, I'm still you know do my photography uh, not as often anymore but I uh -huh. pick up rides here and there uh -huh. and then uh, you know one of my uh, one of my uh, I guess master uh, photographers that I follow that trained me you know she always calls me for help and I'm always you know, I always take a vacation out you know like yeah. I mean can I really afford it in terms of the time spent no but I do it anyway because this is what made me who I am so I pay attention to it from time to time and so I'm doing another wedding this September uh, out in I think Martha's Vineyard uh, nice. and so yeah so I get to you know I get to travel do these fun things you know and it's a nice break from the everyday you know working routine. for my own type of routine yeah and then uh, I also started a small business consulting uh, a small business consulting firm uh, and that was inspired because I have a really active mind and so all my friends here who are business you know owners in the community have always talked to me about their problems and I've always helped them solve them right. uh, and I, I always gave that out and I never asked anything in return because wow. the way I saw it was no I, you know a lot of people are like wow you're so nice no no it's just it's not it's not all altruistic a part of it is that I get to exercise my brain. I get to, I get to, see, you know, test my chops, if you will, right. uh, and at the same time with other people's money. So, and, I, <laughs> and I tell, this is all full disclosure. I tell them that I'm like, you know, you know, you don't have to thank me. You know, you're testing my theory using your money. You know, if, <laughs> yeah. it, if it passes, great, I'm happy. And if it and if it fails, you know, that's still not my fault, right? So that was the best situation for me to kind of like, it. you know, earn my stripes, so to speak. Um, but it has come to time where I realize I don't have the time anymore and people are still asking for help. And so I, I basically I partnered up with one of my uh, ex-employees that used to work for me that uh, gone on to do better things. And then, uh, you know, and, and me and him are, are basically uh, helping other small businesses get on the web, get a presence, you know, get on, you know, maybe a new, you know, like the new century of advertising and whatnot. Because a lot of people are still stuck on TV and radio. I mean. I love TV and radio, I guess, you know, but like I only listen to radio in the car and pretty right. much never else. Right. TV we watch on the internet these days, of you know, course. and so they're constantly having trouble reaching their market and so that's what I help them with. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, now, you know, I get to exercise and get paid, <laughs> which is always the fun part of it, right? Um, and so that's, uh, so that's how that came about. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, does your consulting firm have a name? Or uh, yeah, it's called uh, Sociable Like Me. Uh, oh, neat. Which is, uh, it's funny, it's, uh, it's a real name, Sociable Like, uh, which uh, pertains to the Facebook like system. Mm -hmm. So we, well, we don't want just people to mindlessly click like, like, like. We want a sociable like. We want a relation, a relationship with our customer. And that's why it's called a social like, not just a regular like. And nice. then, uh, you know, and taking advantage of the dot me domain names that have recently released, you know, Sociable Like Me is kind of like a more of a slightly boastful way of saying, hey, you know, anyone can do it, you know? Right. So, you know, and then, you know, if you need help, come ask us, we'll help you, you know, do what you what you need to do. So oh, that's, that's fantastic. That's how the name came about, yeah. All right, that's very neat. <laughs> and are you in your franchising, right? Uh, yes, uh, I uh, just recently talk, finished uh, drafting papers for my lawyers and whatnot. It's not exactly franchising, it's more licensing, oh, okay. uh, but it's very similar, you know. Okay. Um, what I've created here is a concept that I believe is ready for the greater, uh, you know, nation, America, you know. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of times with what bubble, the problem with bubble tea is that, and, and tea houses like mine are, is that they routinely stick to the Chinatowns and the Asian communities. Uh, because they feel safe, they feel that oh, mm -hmm. you know, people are Asian around here. They must like my stuff, you know. Right. Oh, I can't go out there into you know the Midwest. I can't go out there into uh, upstate. You know, those people, they're, they're American. They, they they won't accept us. They won't like this. Uh -huh. and, and it's that mentality that I'm trying to break. That I have broken. Yes. Uh, and and, you and, have. and I really and, and I really want to extend that to you know not just say okay I need another you know Asian owner. No, I'm looking for entrepreneurs of any type, you know, any race, any color, it does not matter, you know, as long as they like the product, because I believe that this is a product for everybody, that human beings are one. And so if, if somebody from, you know, India likes it, then somebody from America must, could find a reason to love it just the same, uh, as long as they're giving a fair chance. I do. You know, I love I, <laughs> your bubble tea. That's, that's, that's the whole point. The whole point is that it's not, taste is not singular, you know, it's not oh, only these people like it, only those people yeah. like that, you know what yeah. I mean? And as long as you give it a chance, you know, you can find similarities that you like. Like you might not like every single drink because some might be actually to a different palate, but mm -hmm. you can sure find a common denominator in it all. And so that's really what I want to do is I want to help 
people open more of these stores, you know, and, and, and spread them out throughout and share, you know, something unique with everybody and not just keep it within the Asian community and keep it within all closed doors and keep it as a mystery uh, for everybody. You know, and there's no reason for, for that. Reflective of your generation, I think. Yeah. Do you think that's true? Uh, I mean, wanting to, you know, really be more globally minded and not just you know, sticking to one's culture and... A lot of time when I think about my generation, I just think about the, you know, the Kickstarters and the Indiegogos and, right. and the multitudes of businesses that become Stars. erected. The little, the little guy who invents a case for the iPhone and gets funding from crowd, you know, uh, you know, and the projects that have been funded so far, especially particularly in the tech community, have been, you know, nothing short of amazing. Right, and, 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 and this is, I think, is what's reflective, is that America is going back to a uh, more of an industrial revolution part two, you know, type, type <laughs> yeah. of thing, you know, because yeah. we're going back to, you know, I, and, you know, the roots of it all, you know, what made this country great, you know, we're building things again, we're making things again, you know, we're not just like, letting, you know, Japan and, and Korea and China do all the manufacturing and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think that that's what made this country great and that's why my parents came to America, is for this opportunity to do that, to right. be, you know, for the education, for the bright, you know, future that is supposed to be ahead of us, you know, and I think somewhere along the way we lost sight of that, I think somewhere along the way, at one time I actually told, told my mom, I was like, wow, mom, you know, you moved all the way here, you did all this work just so I could go immigrate back to China. Because at the time I was thinking about going back to Hong right. Kong for a job, because unfortunately that's where all the that's where all the, the hot things are now. Right. You know, and it's like this back and forth, you know, all the sacrifices my parents made for me to just go back to China seem almost comedic. Uh, right. Yeah. And it's slightly ironic. You know, so, oh, absolutely. So yeah. So you know, and it doesn't dawn on a lot of people, you know. But it, it's actually true, you know. So I think I really support this whole, you know, small spirited, you know, entrepreneurship route uh, in America because I think that's what's going to bring it back from where it was. It will be, it's like re-energizing a whole society. That's right. Because sort of now like. we're all worried about, you know, sending our our factories abroad, sending our workers abroad. You know, we're we're going to go outsource this, outsource that, mm -hmm. and I mean, all it is is. We're losing money as a country, just leaking it out there to some other countries. Right. And where is the income coming from? You know, right. where do we get an in, in, inflow? Of, you know, who's buying stuff from America to balance this out? I mean, what are we providing as a country? Right. And so these little innovations is, is what's going to do. It's what's going to make the difference. Right. Yeah. Well, one thing, I, a couple of things I want to comment about, and that is, um, before I forget, is that. Lime Red, my experience of coming here over the last number of years, is that it's a really community-minded um, place. I mean, when I come in here, I may see, as I did today, a mother with her young children. You see college students. You see people such as myself. Um, you see couples of all ages. And it just friends, groups of friends. So it really does, you've really been successful in creating a gathering place for the community. So I think that that's, and you, you're, I, I, I sense that that's an important part of what you're doing. Is that right, um, you know, uh, and that go back to, to even the name. The name itself, Live Red, uh, as I told many times before, is really just a, a name like any other. Mm -hmm. uh, it was put together uh, as a forum back in the old days, uh, you know, when that when I was tinkering around with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the whole purpose was to keep my high school friends together after we graduated and went on to college. And so it was a social place. I imagined we would read news paper articles and then discuss them, you know, like all that, you know, highbrow things, you know. And, uh, you know, it never happened. You know, my friends, you know, they went on Facebook instead. And they did all these things. And I fought Facebook for a long time. You know, now, you know, I'm on it too. But anyway, the point is that, you know, that was what the name was. And so when it came to this cafe, when we started it, we named it Lime Red to kind of put that vision behind it. You know, we want to create a place where people can hang out because that, to me, is what bubble tea is. Also, you know, in the Absolutely. city, you know, it's like you know, you don't want to, you know, you want to take a girl out, but you don't want to take her to a bar because you know you're not all about right. that, you right. know. Right. And so you want it's just a nice place where you can sit down and have a drink, like like just as if we were at a bar in a different location and a different type of mood setting. You know, it shows that right. you know you're not that, you know, you're not always you know that whole hard party type of person, you know. Right. And so that's where I always brought a lot of my dates and a lot of my friends. We hang out there because it's a place where you don't. There are no demands. You know, nobody's coming at you and saying, "Oh, can I get you something else to drink?" Right, right, you right, know? right, right. Yeah. You know, it was just a fun place to, to be yourself and to it's just purely just to interact with friends, nothing more than that. And and so uh, that was what bubble tea was about for me and my my partner, you know, in New York. 
And so opening here, we wanted to have the exact same thing. We wanted people to bring their dates. We wanted friends to meet. We wanted uh, them to you know talk about us. Uh, you know, in the sense of you know creating memories inside the store. You know, and that's very you know apparent throughout the store here. You know, like you just even look at the post-it notes that people leave. You know, they're all some of it is you know oh yeah we love lime red and, and that's oh, wow that's great I love free word of mouth uh, advertising but but some of it is you know just. Johnny and Jen was here, you know, you know, right. 2000, you know, 12, 2010, you know, and, and these are things that really make a difference and it makes owning this place, you know, a lot easier. Right. Uh, you know, and, and, and it, you know, it makes it hard, you know, if the work that we do, you know, we feel better about it. And that's what we really want. We want this place to create memories and for people to come back years later, you know, oh, I went to school here. Oh my God, this place, you know, like, oh, absolutely. This is, ex this is where I did this. This is where I saw that, you know, and you see it every time, you know, and I love sitting here as a owner because you know these days I don't interact with my customers anymore because it's just not there yes, anymore right, you know right, and right. I have a lot of people working on you know they're the ones that you know right. people don't even know you own the place anymore <laughs> you know whereas you know when you first right. met me everybody was just right. hi, Joe, yeah, hi Joe exactly. you knew what everybody wanted exactly. to order and the exactly yeah, and yeah. now it's totally different and, and so now I just love watching them because they come in they're light their eyes they brighten because they saw a friend they didn't expect to see and then since they're both just hanging out they just sit down and now all of a sudden when they were just going to grab something and leave they're here for another two hours right. and then that's really what what, it, what it's all about you know yeah. for me as an owner yeah, yeah. That's, that's really great um, so um, next question is it sort of circle back to the entrepreneurial thing and, and you were talking um, prior to the interview about being an entrepreneur is probably a little bit romanticized and you want to talk about some of the realities of being an entrepreneur and maybe who should or shouldn't consider being an entrepreneur and what it takes and the background and all the work that's involved. Right. Um, well, in my life as an entrepreneur, I, I hear a lot of people, you know, they come in, they tell me things and they... They tell me what they want to do. You know, they're very excited about the idea, and I mean that's the core of it. You can't be an entrepreneur if you're not excited for the things that you want to create. Of course, of course. Um, but the thing is, uh, but the thing where 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 people start to fall <laughs> off the bandwagon is when people start to tell you about their worries. About I'm worried about this. I don't know how to do that. Uh, and, and and then you show a new side of yourself that you have to work on before you can really say that you want to be an entrepreneur. And that part is uncertainty. You know, um, and, and and part of it is the education. Um, and, and, and part of it is the education that we have is, is that, you know, it's very rigid. It's, uh, it's my kindergarten curriculum. It's my, you know, first grade, third grade. I got to pass the regents. I got to pass the standardized exams. I got to do this. I got to do that. And, and so even all throughout college, it's, you know, you have to take this class. You have to go that route. And, and this puts us in a mindset. And it was very hard for me to break free of that. It's, it's the mindset that uh, we have to be following a certain path somewhere. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's this imaginary, it's, so great. it's an imaginary it. uh, slope that goes all the way up to the right, and, and, and it doesn't end, and it, it has no, it has no plateau. It just, <laughs> it just, you know, every year is better than last year. It's all great, everything's good, and uh, and, and that's, the, that's the mentality that's been ingrained into us. Yeah. So that when we do something that is not a hundred percent, we get worried. We're all of a sudden we're like, wait, I don't know what's on the other side. Mm -hmm. What do I do? You know, and then they start asking, "What do I do? What do I do? What do, what do I do?" And, and and when you start asking those questions, you all you're speaking to me is that you're afraid of the unknown, and when you're afraid of the unknown, you're afraid of the risks, then you don't believe in your idea enough, and you really should not be trying your hand at entrepreneurship because it will destroy spirits. And and I mean that in, 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 in the darkest way you know anyone can imagine is that it destroys spirits because when you're not sure, you wake up every morning, you know, and you don't have to go to class, you don't have to do anything. Right. Actually, you know, like I wake up, I could I could have stayed home today, mm -hmm. and this place would have ran fine without me, you know. Right. But whether or not this place becomes better or not is all upon what I imagined myself to be doing. Right. So I, every day I pick out exactly like clothes that you wear. You know, what am I going to do today? And how? What am I going to accomplish today? And how is that going to help my business? And that's something that I have to do every single day. Nobody gives me an agenda, you know, every morning and say, hey, today get these things done. You know, like, hey, do the homework. You know, the homework's due this day, you know, right. and go do it. You know, it's not like that. And, and that scares a lot of people. And so really, you know, my advice for anybody who wants to watch more is, is, is don't be afraid of the unknown, you know. The impossible is only impossible until you hear about someone else doing it. You know? right. And then all of a sudden it's, oh, not so impossible after all. Right. You know, and then it was easy. And then uh, then all of a sudden I could have done that, you know. Like, <laughs> right. You know. Right. And so and so really, it, you know, and it's really for those that really aren't afraid of, of, of trying something. and. 
and being secure. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying go for it, forget about the risks. I have my backups. You know, like I've I've been fortunate enough that you know, like because of all that I know and all that my curiosity has brought me. You know, I don't. I'm not. One-sided, you know. Like if I if this doesn't work out, I can be a photographer. If photography doesn't work out, I can be a web designer. If web design doesn't work out, I can always go back to my old boss who's still asking, mm-hmm. "How's the business?" <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know. Right. And and, and so oh, like you know and, and so for me you know I'm set up like that. So I have no fears moving forward, and and I give myself wholeheartedly to my endeavors, and that's really the hard part. A lot of people say, "I'll keep my job." And I'm gonna go and do this part time. I'm gonna start my business on the side while I'm a lawyer or while I'm whatever, you know. And and, and, and it's not for those people, you know, because you can't, you know. This is a full time job. This is a full time, full night, full day, any time of the hours, you know. That type of job, you know. So you can't possibly be working for somebody else and then come home and expect to have the energy, you know, to work for yourself. Because I demand a lot out of my employees. There's no way they can do what I do after they come home, you know. And if your boss is any anywhere as good as I, you know, anywhere you know as good as I am, they're not going to let you be so refreshed to come home with a, you know, with a, you know, so calm and collected. I'm going to go start work. It's more like I'm going to pop a beer and I'm going to sit down and watch a football game, and then all of a sudden your night's done. So that's really more what it was like. And back in corporate, it was like that too. It was hours of driving uh, and, and whatnot. And at the end of the day, it was really not that much time for myself. Right. You know, so those, those people they have the wrong idea about what entrepreneur is. You know, so that's what I, that's what it means when you say romanticize. You know. Yes. Okay. It's not. It's not. It. It's yeah. not something you do on the side. It right. It's right. a part-time thing. You have to jump in with both feet. But you mentioned you have the backup. And also, I mean, you you did, in, in, in your education, you did choose to go into business. Is that right? Do you see that you do use those skills that have uh, become useful? Or is it more that you've had to learn them on your own? All the good stuff I learned on my own. <laughs> okay. But the framework, I cannot deny that my education in business has helped me with. You know, it helped me understand the relationships between why do I need an accountant? You know, well, what is this about? <laughs> Why do I have to file these things with the IRS? What is this? You know, right. and those are things that scare people. And because I kind of knew the framework, as in to say, okay, the government collects taxes on this, that, that. Because I understand the broader framework, I'm able to understand why I need certain things. Right. You know, and why I need, you know, a CPA. Why I need, you know, somebody else, you know, to come and consult for me. Right. You know, otherwise, a lot of why I see a lot of old school entrepreneurs do is that I got this. You know, they they are the janitor, they are the accountant, they are the Financial planner, they are the CEO, the growth officer, they're everything all at once, and I I find that to be a little overwhelming for them, and they don't realize that they are a victim of their own success. You know, it's like they are successful. Yeah, you know, they run great businesses, but they are trapped in prison, just like as if they were working for somebody else, except that their own boss is them, and now they're the ones that are putting themselves through that. You know, right, where they're stuck here 18 hours a day. You know, because they're there morning, they're there till night. You know, and they think that hard work is what. You know, it's you don't have to work harder. You have to work smarter. Right. You know, so that's why you know, like the only way that I'm able to run multiple businesses at once is if I work with a high efficiency that is not. That does not require me to be on site every day of the week, every hour of my opening day. And well, that also says something about you as an employer that you have trained and supervised your staff so that you don't have to be here on site. That you can rely on them to run things as you would, as if you were here. Right. That creates more jobs. You know, it reduces yeah. the amount of money I keep overall, but it's worth it because oh, that's absolutely. it frees me up to do more things and then do what I love. You know, because that's one point I never forget that you know I work for myself. So I am my own boss. So all the pressures I have, all the stress that I deal with, I never forget that I'm the one that put that on me. You know, nobody else. And once you realize that, then you understand that you know you can back down a little bit. You know, yeah, you sacrifice you know some of the growth that you might experience, but it's your life and you get to your handle on it. And that goes back to what I said. There is no rigid path for you to go. You know, there is no. You must do this. You must do that. You know, how successful you want to be is in the function of how hard you're willing to work. You know, and so if you want to take it a bit easy and you don't mind making a little bit less, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. And so there's no guidelines for that. And, and I was really inspired what you said about your employees that you um, you yourself kind of push them um, not to just settle with working at Limeland and tea houses. So you want to talk about that? Well, I personally believe that I, I want to pay everybody the most I can, you know, because I don't think you know living barely above the poverty line is a living. 
you know, and, and, and so I wish I could pay my employees, you know, a, a lot more than what I actually do pay them, you know, and a lot of them, some of them get comfortable. It's a nice job. We have, we're very employees uh, centric here at Lime Red, and so it's a lot, it's a family, yeah. and, and you know, and I understand that sometimes it might be hard to leave that, you know, that it might be standing in your way. Uh, and a lot of times I don't like to see that because I see this, you know, it's okay if you're a college student and you're working for me and whatnot, and you know, but it's not okay if this is your career. You know, I want to inspire, you know, my employees to move on, take this experience and go and, 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 and do better and, and make things on their own, you know, or, or just follow their own dreams. Because nobody dreams about, you know, being a garbage man, but garbage men are paid very, very nicely because nobody wants to be a garbage man, you know, and nobody dreams about being, you know, a worker at, at, at a tea house or a coffee house either, you know. So, uh, but a lot of times we forget you know, how to move forward. And I don't want any of my employees to forget that because I, I want them to move on. I want them to earn a better living and, and, and take a better life, you know? And if I can provide for them, I will. You know, and if I can pay them more, I will. You know, I'm not one of the, you know, recently there was these articles about McDonald's, you know, making billions of dollars and then pushing their employees to go and like get public help. You know, and, and that's a terrible thing for them to do. You know, and, and I tell my employees all the time, you know, like CEO, I'm not making a million dollars, I can be honest with you, you know, sure. and, and especially with my managers who see my books and see my finances and whatnot, I tell them, listen, you, you see them, I'm not hiding anything from you, of course, you know, right. so you see everything, so so the moment I become one of that, that corporate mo mongrel, right, you can tell me, you know, but until then, you know, like, please understand, that is the most I can pay you, you know, as a small business, and, and, and that's not to say that you're not worth more, you know, and, I, and if you find an opportunity, go. You know, not because I'm saying I don't need you, because I'm happy to see you go. Because I know that you can go move on faster. You can move up faster working with somebody else. If that somebody else has, you know, more potential, of course, you know, uh, and whatnot. But as long as you need me, I'm here for you, you know. And that's what I mean by employee centric. You know, we have no requirements on them, and yet we're gonna be there for them if they need it. You know, if you need a job, you can always come back. But when I when I see you come back. It, it makes me cry a little bit inside, you know? So I, I try to push my workers out, I try to help them, I set their resumes up, you know? Because I used to do a lot of that when I was in college, you know? I help people with their resumes and I help them get the jobs that they want, you know? And I, and I haven't stopped. I've referred quite a few people in the college community to, with my old superiors at my old job. Uh, and also, wow. you know, yeah. And Incredible. so so I've gotten them jobs before, so I've really loved, and they and, and they still love me, I keep, you know, for, for providing this connection. So I give them, like, wow. you know, so. So you're like a mentor and advisor. And, and now, how many employees, I mean, in, in addition to being an entrepreneur and opening up the, the tea houses and the franchise and so on and so forth, you're also, an you know, an employer. How many employer, employees do you actually have? Uh, I would say about, it ranges, it depends mm -hmm. on, on, on the day, some people leave, some people come in, but we average around like 25 between the two stores here. Wow. Uh, so... So you've created jobs? Oh yeah, yeah def definitely, and, yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to create them like later, uh, like what is that, laterally too, you know, like, because I want to, you know, like this, the, the basic levels are, you know, people, you know, that kind of just want to have a job, you know, right. for, for allowance purposes, not really, no one's making a living out of this and right, whatnot. Sure. Then you have, you know, my supervisors, which are the more that, you know, I, I, I this is my real job, I work hours right. and things like that. Right. And then I have, you know, two managers that run my host stores and uh, they're relatively new. I just created that position maybe three months ago, so they're still in training. Uh, you know, and so I'm hoping to create jobs on top of that, on top of that. So one day, I will, my real, you know, hope is that I can pay my workers, you know, sixty thousand dollars, you know, thirty thousand, so like from really? thirty wow. to sixty thousand dollars to create like a not not just a job but a career. It's a career, you know, and that's what I really want, and that's why I tell my managers, you know, is that you know today you're a manager of one store, tomorrow I. You help me. You can be a manager of a region, you know. And, and this is where I'm going. And you're more than welcome to jump aboard. You know, I'm moving there with or without you. But you know, yeah. if you want to help, wow, you know, welcome. That's so wonderful, so, so inspiring. So, as you know, I'm all about making education relevant. And could you address that in terms of what knowledge, experience, um, education um, do you consider relevant for the 21st century? You know, looking back on your own education and you know things that you've had to learn, skills you've had to acquire, and so on and so forth to pull this all off. Where's the gap? Where's the you know? How could we do better? What could we do to make education more relevant to those skills that are required in the 21st century to really be successful? 
There's many ways to answer the question. I guess the easiest way is is uh, is to keep up with the times. It's really to see what constantly revisit the curriculum. You know, I mean, I learned a lot of things, and I am grateful for for my education. You know, I, I went through public education from kindergarten all the way up to college. You know, and you know, and, and it's brought me places. So I make no doubt about that. You know, however, there's a lot, like I said, a lot of the rigidness of it all, you know, the standardizations and, and things like that. You know, standardization only makes people as good as the standard. You know, it doesn't reward those that are above, and you know, it doesn't help those that are below because they just say, okay, you're going to get left back this year. You know, you did not pass this test. You know? <laughs> and, right. and not everybody's great test takers, you know. And, right. and, and I hate to see America follow the path of the, of the Asian countries, you know, because that's what they're doing. They're always memorization testing it's always been like that in China it's like that in Korea you know and and it's, it's just it's, and, and when they come over here to study abroad and, and I talk to them they get nervous they can't write essays because that requires them to take knowledge and put it in a different format you know it's not one plus one is two obviously you know and, and it's not like that you have to actually wield you know, your power of words around to make uh, create something new and that scares some of them you know, and, 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 and I always wonder why, you know, because as, you know, you know, being educated in America, that's all we do is write essays. So I really didn't understand. And, and so, you know, you know, for them, it's because they have to keep memorizing that that's how they, they, that's how they compute. And because of that, they're very rigid and they can't really move beyond the box. You know, and, and, and when I see regents and I see standardized tests that you have to take and things like that, no child left behind type of thing, you know, it makes it like really rigid. Mm -hmm. and, and I think education needs to be a lot more fluid, a lot more of dealing, teaching people how to be problem solvers, you know, mm -hmm. to think, uh, you know, across all, all, all horizons and not just, you know, be all, you know, narrow-minded towards, because that's what I memorize. You know, there's many ways to reach the same conclusion, right? There's many ways to get to the place that you need to go. And, and I think that education should somehow incorporate that. You know, and I see a lot of design your own majors now and things like that kind of give you the choice to do the decision to, to you know, and, and it has to be somewhere in between. You know, I don't know if I can trust a freshman in college to decide what curriculum is best for them in order to get them to where they need to go for success because, you know, I've just studied video, video game theory all day long and <laughs> I'm not sure how much that's going to help me, yeah. you know. So, so it's not that I, I you know, I want to be no guidance, you know, but I, I think oh, that, you know. Yeah, you need a guidance, absolutely. Right, right. And, right. But I just wish that it was more, a lot, a lot, a lot less stressing our conformity and a lot more maybe on, on the individual. And, 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 and yeah. this is the idealistic thing to say because you know, obviously with the realities of budgeting and, and tax dollars and things like that, you know, a lot of what we're saying is just, is just wishful thinking uh, at the most. But I think the immediate improvement would just be to teach kids about real life, to teach, teach them that, uh, you know, a few things that I tell everybody that I meet, I said, you know, you think your boss is a mean, authoritative person? No, he kicks back with a beer just like you. You know, he you know goes and makes fun of you guys just like you make fun of him. <laughs> you know, because you and, and, and you know how I know because my friends are managers, my friends are partners, my friends are you know vice presidents and and, and whatnot. And that's what we do. <laughs> you know, like we didn't grow up; we just got older. You know, <laughs> so a lot of times, you know, and, 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 and to be you know the reality of it is that is like that's the structure that that's been so ingrained into me. You know, that everybody has to follow that. You know, and we forget what the reality of it is that is that we don't want to grow old we grow old but we're not old you know and so and that's really what brings the you know i think youth is a frame of mind right so so i think a lot of it what they can do is they can teach people that that line is not like that it's not you know get good grades you know because that that's a formula that worked for the past generations get good grades get good job you're set for life right. you know that's not today's reality is not like that today's reality is you get good grades you get your good job you work 30 40 years you put it all in your 401k and then you come out into retirement and it's a market crash and then your 401k is worth as much as you know last year's shoes you know and, and, <laughs> and it really because that's what happened to people in 08 you know if you oh, yes. were a retiree in 2008 you did not have a good time right. you know because your 401k was worth next to nothing right. you know and don't get me wrong tons of people that went into the market and made a ton of money out of it but not you right right exactly, <laughs> you know exactly. so 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 that's the thing we look at it on a macro perspective america's fine you know but we look at a micro perspective you know like you could have been one of those unlucky ones right. you know and i asked you know america's you know workers today you know 
what does your 401k gonna look like in 40 years? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me for certain? And the answer is no, it's impossible. You can't predict that. Right. You know, no matter what, you know, the value of it fluctuates. So everyone's pouring money into this imaginary fund that's supposed to grow and balloon out, but yet has no guarantees of doing so. And so at the end of the day, you know, this path of, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, doesn't really work anymore you know because that's no longer a valid you know we don't get a pension right. you know it's not a b c d anymore it's you know you can you can start with z you know you can start with d you know wherever you want to go you know and i think that you know i, I want to see the future of america be less afraid of taking risks that 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 you know less afraid of the unknown you know and, that, and that's you know my advice for entrepreneurs is that you know don't be afraid of the unknown, you know, and if you have the guts to, to do that, you know, to, to, you know, go through it all, you know, when I first opened this, I had no idea, what permits do I need, uh, I don't know, what, 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 what does the health department want from me, you know, what do I have to do, what are the cleaning processes that I have to, you know, one step at a time, you know, we made it through one step at a time, and, and which is a, it's a march, you know, and you keep marching forward, and then all those unknowns become fact become knowledge become you know my next door I don't worry about that anymore mm -hmm. you know I know you know that things have to be six inches off the ground I know <laughs> that you know I can't put an electrical wire next to this you know <laughs> like these are things that I've learned over the years but I had to start from somewhere you know mm -hmm. and Google is your friend <laughs> oh absolutely yeah, so well and, and what you, you know what you're saying is basically as you said don't be afraid of the unknown and you don't have to know everything ahead of time you don't feel like in order to be a successful entrepreneur, you need to know everything in order to do it in advance. You do it and you learn as you go. And it's the funny part because I have all my managers like, I'm not like you. I'm like, what, like me what? You're not human? You don't breathe? You don't <laughs> have the same organs I do? What do you mean you're not, I'm not, I'm not like you? Yeah. It's like, you know all these things. I don't. You know, and, that, and that's what surprises them. It blows their mind. Like, what do you mean you don't? Wait, you have no idea what you're doing? I'm like, no, I have no idea what I'm doing. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I don't know if, you know, a ton of people are coming tomorrow or nobody's coming tomorrow. I have no idea, <laughs> you know? I have no idea if, if these things work or not, you know? <laughs> Your idea is as good as mine. And, and, and that's the ultimate equalizing factor that they don't understand. That's when the, that's the reveal that they're all of a sudden, it's like a, it's like the you know, plot twist and, and the sixth sense, you know? <laughs> like, it's, it's like, you know, that's, that's how it is for them because then they're like, wait, what? I thought you were, you know, a bastion of authority, a, a, you know, a steadfast, you know, torrent of ideas and whatnot. And they don't understand how freestyle it is, you know, ah, up on the top. Word. You know, and, 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 and improv is, is exactly what it's all about. You know, how do we take, you know, it's because no rule is going to work. I once had a, one of my employees was, uh, was literally giving this lady a hard time because she didn't have a penny. You know, it, it, the total was four dollars and one penny. And she did not have a penny and he gave, demanded a dollar so that she could give him, he could give her back 99 cents. And I, you know, that's what happens when you write rules. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that's yes. you know that interaction is what happens. You know, do do my employees have the right to be like, you know what, Joe doesn't need that penny, right? And and, <laughs> and, 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 you, and you know, and make Lyman look like a you know more friendlier place than you know, <laughs> give me that penny, you know. <laughs> and so you know, and that's my experience. When you write rules, people follow the rules to what they think is the right thing, mm -hmm. and it's not always what you want. You know, you can't write rules for everything. Right. So. That's a really good point, and I, I love the the um, picture that you created with education there's always the next step which somebody else has created and you do this and you do this you do this and you really become very passive and then th what is sort of this open unknown territory with entrepreneurism is there isn't any necessarily there isn't any formula there can be guidance and you can as you have networked with other people that are doing what you're doing and learn from them and you can and so on and so forth but it's not like it's scripted right it's not no one like can tell you how to be a good entrepreneur right. and that's the best part that's the best part is that you don't know if you have what it takes and that's why I constantly test myself that's why I listen to everybody's problems because I'm constantly saying am I one hit wonder am I one hit wonder am I one hit wonder and really you know try to validate myself and, and a lot of entrepreneurs do that they they try their best to validate themselves so they don't have a boss to say good job buddy uh, you know you're really you've good done point. great 
Right. You know, I think that, you know, you're going to go here's places. Here's your bonus. <laughs> yeah, here's your bonus. You're going to go places, son. <laughs> yeah, <you're right. laughs> you know, exactly. we don't have that. And so, and that's, and that's you know, and, and, but that's necessary. You know, like, I give my employees encouragement all the time, and nobody's there to really give me encouragement. Right. And so that's, you know, that's part well, of the... Well, then where do you do it? I mean, this will sort of will wind up. <laughs> but where do you, where are the wellsprings of your energy and your inspiration and your, you know, your spirit to keep moving forward and growing and expanding? Where does it happen? Where do you get that? Where does that come from? Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, it comes from my parents. You know, it mm -hmm. comes a little bit of you know what they've done and how they've changed America to be their playground, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and, and I have a high pressure to do the same. You know, like I don't want to just you know uh, become you know a little bit better than them because they've jumped waves. You know, and I can't jump the same wave. It's impossible, right? Uh, well, March on returns, you know. You're first generation Asian American, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and so what what it is is that you know I just want to make a difference and and, and be able to propel my generation to be further. You know, I want to inspire, you know, not only my family, like my other cousins and things like that, but my friends, you know, a lot of my friends, they, they're, you know, I feel pressure from them, you know, because they are the ones that are continually in their jobs, uh, you know, in the corporate world, and they're making this, making that, it doesn't really matter how much they make, it's about how happy they are, and they all look at me with, with the same eyes I had before I started, which is wide-eyed, you know, like, wow, this guy, <laughs> you know, and like, he gave it all up, you know, to do this, you know, and they don't really understand the hardships I go through, but, but they're always, like, they have a high respect for that, and I want to maintain that, I don't want them to feel discouraged and do the same, because I personally believe that everybody should be doing the same, everybody should take their futures into their own hands, you know, and then we don't need you know, it's, it's, this is ironic. I want to be a corporation, right? And I want to be big like them, right? But but we don't need them. You know what I mean? Anybody, I could have went with a franchise. I didn't have to start my own, you know? I But I did, you know what I mean? And so to say that I want to franchise to somebody else is only to say as much as they don't want to do it themselves. You know what I mean? But if they have what it takes to do it themselves and they don't mind learning themselves, go for it. Don't, don't buy stuff from me. You know right. what I mean? Right. But it's for those that are, you know, maybe, you know, because I realize that there are different people out there. Some are just not as motivated as others. Right. You know, and those that are most motivated are the ones that are going to make the most in terms of, because it makes it easier for everybody. You know, I have a whole package. You know, everybody wants a franchise for me. I give you everything, the keys to the kingdom. You know what I mean? So you don't have to really think about it. Now, you could do changes on your own and make it your style, but overall, all the unknowns are now explained. You know, so technically, I took the hard part about being an entrepreneur. Now it's just where you're able to take the risk of finding the monetary risk, right? Right. So, you know, that takes the fun out of it for me. You know, so it's not, you know, but for some other people, that's exactly what they need. Right. You know, there's a reason why franchises sell. It's because people don't want to be figuring out all these things that I've already figured out. You right. know, they want to, you know. So, yeah, so as I say that, I want to be a corporation. I want to make money like they do at the same time. Nobody needs them. You know, nobody needs them. You know, so so, you know, you can always break apart and do your own thing. It's basically, it. I think I'm really diverting from the original point here. But oh, no, yeah. no, this is all very rich. This is all very, so. very rich. Well, and the other thing, I maybe in winding down to end, I just like to, you know, comment that Lime Red has become the place to go to in Amherst. And as you mentioned before, when parents come and visit their children at the area colleges. You've got to go to Lime Red. And I say the same thing. When I have relatives or friends right. or my children come, I go, we're going to go to Lime Red because right. you've got to see this place. And, you know, and they'll say bubble tea and, and oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Or, yeah, I have that somewhere. I'll say, wait, you need to go. And right. this, is, this is the authentic. So anyway, so I commend you for that. Kudos to you. In just three years, you've done that and expanded. And you're a real inspiration model. So well, I hope and, to be able to help. <laughs> and I thank you so much for this interview because I know you're a very, very busy man and rushing back and forth. Boston and so on and so forth and I wish you the very best and I want to I want to mention that this is the best bubble tea and Joe remembered that what my favorite grapefruit with lychee yep so <laughs>